expert flowchart stands for exercise prescription in daily practice and exercise based cardiac rehabilitation. And the project is about a digital tool that is being developed that assists healthcare professionals to prescribe exercise to patients with cardiovascular disease. We gathered 31 colleagues throughout Europe out of 11 European countries and we collected exercise recommendations for all the different cardiovascular factors and diseases that are currently present. And these diseases, these recommendations were imputated in a digital tool that automatically prescribes exercise based on the fill out during your consultation. And by using this tool, we try to minimize the gap between practice and recommendation. The take home message will be for, um, to look up the recommendations, to try to take up those recommendations, uh, to optimize exercise prescription and not to use the approach one size fits all because that doesn't work. A patient does not appear to you in one size, they appear to you in a thousand different sizes needing a thousand different kinds of approaches. When we think about stress in the population, the difficulty is we can't, we can't do an experiment on stress in the way that you can uh, with some other factors. We, you know, we can't randomize half the population to have high levels of work stress, half the population to have low levels of work stress. So we always have to think in terms of, is this really a causal relationship or perhaps there's something else which is underlying the association between stress and heart disease. So these are quite important and difficult scientific problems. If you look at uh, in large-scale studies and you start off with a, a large population of healthy people and you measure, for example, uh, whether they are socially isolated or not, uh, and then you follow people up over time, what you see is something like a 20% increase in risk of developing heart disease in those people who are more uh, socially isolated. I think the main thing is to be alert to the possible impact of stress on your patients. Although I've just been talking about prevention, uh, stress processes don't stop at the time someone has a heart attack or develops some clinical condition. In fact, they remain, if anything, even more important in the period after someone has acquired heart disease. And so being sensitive to those issues, uh, possibly bringing in more specialist support for people who are um, definitely depressed or who are living under very chronic uh, uh, levels of stress would be valuable, I think. Anxiety and depression after cardiac events are in fact very, very common and much more common than most people realise. So the, the actual prevalence, for instance, of major depression in most societies is about 5 or 6 percent in almost all societies. It's, if you've had a cardiac event, then the, the rate is usually something like 10 to 15 percent. If you have heart failure, then the rate on average is over 20 percent as well as just not feeling well, the patients who are depressed have less compliance to medical regimens, so they don't adhere to things in the same way. They are much less likely to turn up for appointments. They're much, much more likely to return to smoking. They're much less likely to bother taking their tablets. So there's a whole lot of issues of adherence of these patients to medical regimens, as well as the fact that they just feel bad and as well as it being such a major predictor of future events, very powerful. These can be prevented, and if, if patients do get significantly depressed, then they can actually be treated as, as well as uh, being prevented. So it's a very hopeful situation, but we must detect it. We must be alert to picking it up. We have been looking uh, uh, at our Eurospar surveys, uh, especially the third and the fourth survey, uh, at the time trained in uh, lifestyle and risk factor management of patients who are at high risk of developing cardiovascular disease in Europe. We were very disappointed about the results uh, because we were hoping that there will be some improvement in the lifestyle and risk factor management of these patients. Unfortunately, uh, 
we couldn't see any significant changes in terms of management of smoking or overweight or obesity or control of blood pressure and diabetes. And uh, nearly 20% of patients, they were smokers in both surveys. 80%, more than 90%, they were overweight, more than 40% obese, and uh, less than 40% of them, they had their blood pressure and uh, LDL cholesterol control. Do we have to do something more to uh, implement better the guidelines in everyday clinical practice? And uh, we believe that needs, uh, we need the special preventive cardiology program uh, focused on this patient and uh, uh, which are multidisciplinary, comprehensive, to be focused on all risk factors, not in one or two factors in isolation. And of course we need uh, some healthcare system which invests in prevention. In London, Alberico Catapano, current president of the European Atherosclerosis Society, summarised the latest advances in LDL management. We have witnessed really a breakthrough discovery in the recent year in the area of LDL lowering. We now have a full armamentary of drugs, statins, inhibitors of cholesterol sorbius, and PCSK9 inhibitors that will allow us to be very flexible in the therapy and very, very effective. The main take-home message is now there are no excuses not to reach the target, the goal for therapy that we have addressed in the guidelines, the common guidelines between European Atherosclerosis Society and European Society of Cardiologists. I know those goals are demanding. 70 mg per deciliter is not easy to reach, 1.8 millimole. However, now the tools are there, and especially in very high-risk patients, patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, no excuses anymore. Detect the patient and treat them.